Um, so everyone knows we're now recording. Um, okay, and now I'm going to share my screen. So everyone now should be able to see uh, the slide um, with the land mobility service on, etc. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, welcome, John. Um, are you yes. now suitably recovered from rushing into <laughs> a round of the digital world and ready to go? Yes, a full, a full round. Uh, this is the trouble with Zoom uh, and the Zoom meetings. But uh, thank you, Henry, and thank everyone for, the, for their patience um, uh, the, uh, this morning, this afternoon. Um, yes, I'm John McAllister. I'm the Land Mobility Manager for Northern Ireland. We are, it's a programme funded by, part funded by Department of Agriculture um, and the Prince's Countryside Fund. It's also supported by Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster and Ulster Farmers Union. Um, you go to the next slide, please, Henry. Uh, it really is about how the, the program came about. Um, so Young Farmers did a survey showing that almost half of farmers uh, aged 50 and over had no identified successor. Average age of a Northern Ireland farmer is 58, which I think is broadly similar to uh, right across the UK. We had a land use report also that showed that only 18% of our land area was in its optimum state of fertility. So we were building on these stats to really say we, we do have a serious structural problem here and how do we start to fix it? How do we bring a new generation of farmers in um, and how, how do we address some of that, uh, that land use 18% uh, and its uh, optimum fertility. Um, so moving to the next slide is looking at how we're going to uh, address that. Several issues and themes came up on this. How do we get farmers collaborating together? Um, we, we do tend to have a saying here that sometimes the only way you can get two farmers to collaborate is if they're going to do a third one. Um, so that's, we needed to get into a more positive way of thinking about farmers collaborating. We also needed to get much better at talking about succession and succession planning. Um, and it is like, as, as you know, colleagues will know in, in DEFRA and here in, in DERA, you know, we talk about succession for a long time, but it's very, very easy conversation to put off and for families to put off for another suddenly five years or indeed suddenly uh, it's too late to actually plan it out and um, something events have overtaken you. Around collaborative farming, how do we maximise land use and, uh, and productivity? How do we move to long-term leasing now I'll talk a bit more than that but that's a particular issue in, in northern northern ireland and how do we bring new skills knowledge and next generation you know even in your opening remarks henry talking about what a structure might look like you know in the whole new support packages post brexit and um, all of that how do we bring in and maximize uh, that new generation and new skills coming in, given particularly in Northern Ireland that the agri-food sector is our biggest um, employer and one of the biggest uh, parts of our economy. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so succession planning, how do we remove some of those barriers? How do we help older farmers um, maybe identify a successor? And I think importantly, planning and managing that transition. Uh, I probably took it for granted that when I um, went through agricultural college and came back home to the family farm, that well, we didn't write down or, or have a plan. We did manage the transition, albeit very informally, that we had. Um, and gradually over time, I took on more and more responsibility and my father uh, less. 
and, and encouraging families to talk about succession and what what they want and what the, the plan is rather than just leaving it um, to chance because that's one of the biggest complaints is that you know after someone um, passes away that there wasn't actually particularly clear or any structure as to how uh, the, the farming business was to continue or indeed if it uh, and that also leaves a real pressure on how it continues. So some of the things we want to look at to drive the change was looking at long-term leasing, looking at farm-to-farm -farm contract rearing, production, um, share farming, any type of profit share arrangements, whatever you want to call them, um, partnerships, both family and non-family. Certainly in family, um, partnerships are um, you know, very, very common way of doing business in Northern Ireland. Um, they can be a great way of sharing the profit. But as well as that, making sure they're meaningful partnerships, because I've seen it on farms where uh, it's a partnership, but one of the partners is deemed the more junior partner, isn't actually doing any of the management of the farm. And I've seen other ones where it's, they don't have a partnership, where actually the, the non-partner is doing all of the management of the farm. So how do you get it just to a meaningful partnership and not just um, for, for business and tax purposes? Um, in the Republic of Ireland, they're actually up now as high as a third of non-family partnerships, but they do tie in other supports from the Department of Agriculture and it's not just a business thing with, with um, revenue and customs. Um, next slide, please, Henry. Um, going to long-term leasing, if you think back to the, one of those opening figures about the land being 18% of the land area being uh, in its optimum fertility, we have a, a thing particularly, um, you know, specialised, I suppose, to the island of Ireland, called Conacher, um, which is a really a, a 10 month annually agreed agreement, tends to be uh, paid in November, tends to be very informal, you know, over a cup of tea around the kitchen table when you're paying and you know, okay for next year. Um, and a third of Northern Ireland's land area is set like this. Now, most of it doesn't change on an annual basis, but it, all, it does um, discourage investment uh, in that land. And therefore it isn't good for um, like lime or fencing or keeping land in its optimum state. And I think it's, it's actually counterproductive. It's also been a disincentive probably for some farmers to bring that their rented land into any agri-environment schemes that have been running as well in case they lost that land um, and were in the middle of a, a five-year agri-environment program. So it's been, uh, it, it's actually been, been a bad thing um, and not remotely helpful. It's also difficult to plan a business if you're reliant on this um, rented land and then suddenly you lose it. So there's no incentive for forward planning or investment. Uh, our friends in Ireland have recently, uh, in 2014, brought in excellent tax incentives for leasing. And it's, it's broadly in different bands. And it goes like, uh, very roughly, if you lease for five to seven years, you get um, 10 to 12,000 of a, euros of a tax break. If it's um, up on 15 to 20 years, that rises to about 40,000 euros a year in tax relief. Now, the, uh, the tax take obviously from the land went down, but the productivity from the agri-food sector went up. So the, actually the, the overall tax revenues increased for it. So it was an excellent way and has really driven change in Ireland and certainly something we would like to see um, pushed and considered here, especially for Northern Ireland, it would make a huge difference to us. Looking at contract farming, been much more open to either uh, somebody growing crops for you, rearing heifers or finishing cattle, 
allows you to specialize in certain areas um, and can reduce labor need. You might be a brilliant dairy farmer, but allows you to rearing heifers. So it, it just is a great way. Uh, and we need to be more open and receptive to that type of thing instead of what, you know, wanting farmer to do everything. Um, next slide, please, Henry. The um, share farming is just two uh, separate businesses really working on the one side. So landowner, I have a slide that sort of better illustrates that, but it can of course be anything that's really, uh, you know, any type of profit share uh, arrangement that incentivizes, you know, a younger farmer coming in uh, to the business. Partnerships, very common here as I, uh, said earlier in a great way, I suppose, of bringing in uh, a successor into the business. Uh, next slide. Um, just on share farming, this is one that, um, a, a very basic model. I, I looked at it in, in County Leash in Ireland, and um, it was a, the example there was a, an 80 year old farmer who was wanting back into dairy farming. He'd been wiped out with brucellosis a number of years earlier. He really loved dairying and wanted back into it. So they brought in the young farmer and he was initially doing all the labor and skills and managing and they brought him in on 35%, but they were starting at 160 cows. So he, he, they were bringing in 80 each. So they were 10% each on the cows. And the land, the older farmer was providing at 25%. The sheds and capital, the younger farmer was doing some investment. So they ended up with a 50-50 business share arrangement. The older farmer had four grown up children all in their forties. And he brought them in to discuss what he wanted as well. I was quite impressed with him that he was 80 years of age and he'd signed up to a 15 year share farm agreement. So he, he was fairly, fairly optimistic. And uh, he, uh, I just thought he, for the look of him, he just might make it through, you know. Um, and he was, but that was working really well. And even their dairy co-op split the, the money, the milk check in two evenly and, and they were buying their feed, concentrate through that and they reduced, they took it off. The, the milk check in even proportions will work really well. But I suppose that the message here is anything that works, any type of profit share that brings someone into the business and incentivizes them more than just a wage, um, you know, I would look at and see if that works for, for each farmer. Um, the following, the next slide, I think is the arable one that's just roughly a third for machinery, a third for land, a third for inputs. We wouldn't, uh, in England it would be different, but we wouldn't probably have many very solely specialized arable farmers. We do have some, but not not a, a huge number. Dairy, dairying and pigs and poultry would be some of our biggest sectors, sectors arable. Um, it is there, but, but doing it singularly on its own is, is difficult. Next slide, Henry. Um, so I suppose anything that we'd use to deliver and support agreements, um, so anything that gets, you know, parties working together, it has to be structured and fair to both sides. There's no point in, in you know, you and I, Henry, doing a, a deal if uh, your fate's always to the fire and uh, you can't, you know, you're not going to actually um, be able to survive. So it has to be structured fair. Most people want that confidentiality. Um, and it's getting the right person to work with. We will um, we will all have met people that will annoy us even if they were just saying hello to us. Um, I'm sure I'm sure not in DEFRA, but um, they <laughs> they'll be uh, colleagues like that. Um, and so it has to be the right person to work with. And getting that um, relationship you know, that's, it is a slow burn issue getting that right, but the rewards can can be work really well for people. 
So agreements must be workable and must deliver for all parties. So on to the next slide is just some of the, the young farmers. I mean, you know, all of, all of the, the colleagues that are linked into this um, meeting will know there's a huge land and capital need to get into to farming. So those entry barriers for new entrants are very high. Um, so it's how do we, we identify young farmers that may not have the land and capital, but really have the skills and drive to get in to it um, and present them with viable options. Uh, banks probably need to get better at assessing young people who may not have a huge track record with them and don't have a huge asset base either. Some banks now do accept um, lease agreements and I think it's probably easier in England than it is here, but they're starting. That message is starting to resonate here. Um, next slide, please. They, so it's finding a young farmer that's a passion for farming, having the, the business skills, the people skills. I would stress, and I, I know any work done in, in across the UK and indeed um, Ireland as well, um, the mobility of young people can be an option. We do have some young people that, you know, I would like a great opportunity, but I'd like it at, sort of at the end of the road, please, you know, and, and where sometimes you have to, you know, some of the, one of the most successful ones I set up was uh, a young lad that moved about 70, 80 miles. And that was hugely important just to, to link him in to a really good farm and a brilliant opportunity. But he was at a, an age and was willing to move and, and hasn't looked behind him. So having some support or equity is certainly a huge help. Um, small amount of stock or something. Um, and have a plan knowing where you want to go. We've, uh, you know, the old adage, um, if you don't know where you want to go, any road will take you there. So having a plan and knowing where you want to go is, is hugely important. Um, next slide, please, Henry. Um, I think for, on the other side of the coin, for older farmers and landowners, it's identifying people who want to step back or retire or need, might need to step back and retire. Um, and I think it's, it's, sometimes it's getting those people at a time and encouraging them that this is their decision to be, and making it at the time when they're still able to make that decision rather than have the decision almost forced upon them. And I do get a lot of contact from older farmers that are thinking about this and thinking, you know, where am I going to be in three, four, five years from now, particularly if I'm in my late 60s now, this is not sustainable. I need to start thinking and, and identifying the, uh, a person to bring in. So older farmers that want to retire, need to retire. Um, and I think the, the beauty of this model is sometimes when they'd, when they'd operated things like, you know, farm retirement schemes, it never operated in the UK, but I know it operated in the Republic of Ireland. The difficulty with that was that the farmer had to retire and literally not do anything for, for the next 10 years. But this allows maybe someone with, with 50 years of experience of farming, maybe 50 plus years of experience of farming in the land, it allows them to step back by degrees. It allows them, for example, you know, one that guy that I have doing is still incredibly interested in breeding of cows and the younger person taking over the farm actually needs and welcomes his expertise in breeding. And that actually forms quite a part of their, of their income. So it makes sense to keep that older farmer. So you can dictate the pace, you know, an older farmer might not want to milk, do 14 milkings a week, but might be happy to do three. And it keeps them involved. In, uh, and, and, and actually, in many occasions, it has given an older farmer a new lease of life, identifying that successor and having that model and seeing their business continue on. So it again, links into that capacity about planning it and talking about it and, and thinking what this might look like for the future. Um, next 
slide, please. So it's looking at any of these um, options work for people, suitability, um, being transparent and fair that all the information's on the table. And probably the most important word on that slide is trust. If the trust goes, it doesn't really matter in any set of relationships, whether it's in business or marriage or, or anything else, friendship, uh, it's gone, you know, so you have to have that, that you've been told all the information and you know what's uh, happening. Uh, next slide, I think, should just be getting us into some of the deals done. That's just a range of um, agreements done, long-term leasing, contract rain, share farming, or profit shares, partnerships. I probably wasn't expecting to be doing mediation at, at the start of this, but I, I did have a few incidents where fathers and sons were going to, to war with each other and uh, managed to get um, solutions to all of those. Uh, the next slide would just have the uh, the sectors. You can see dairying is, is the biggest, but that's not surprising. It's the biggest one in Northern Ireland. And I do, I haven't updated that one, apologies. There's a couple of poultry. Probably in profitability terms in Northern Irish farms, dairying, pigs, poultry are the most profitable sectors. Um, a lot of dairy farms would also have, have some element of beef or sheep on them uh, as well. That covers about 9,000 acres in Northern Ireland that, that we've done over the last um, three and a half years, um, which isn't bad from a standing start and considering the past year with um, Brexit, COVID, then back to Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, all, uh, all conspiring against me, but I'm, I'm not taking it personally. Um, next slide, Henry, is just, we probably, the, the first two years of the programme, it was entirely funded by our Department of Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs, or DERA. Then they dropped back to 50% funding and we brought in the Princess Countryside Fund then brought in uh, another 25% of that funding. But we also thought it was important to bring in other partners. So the main partners there are, are the four main milk buyers in Northern Ireland, which Dale Farm, uh, Glambia, uh, Arevo and Lakeland. Glambia, Arevo and Lakeland all operate on both sides of uh, the border. So they do fund a, a bit um, uh, south of the border as well as uh, in Northern Ireland. Dale Farm doesn't operate south of the border, but it does have some processing plants in the north of England and in Scotland. Um, and then the, the next slide will just show the red meat sector. It's also important to bring in the Northern Ireland Meat Exporters and the Livestock Meat Commission and all their constituent Companies, uh, I mean, there'd be a number of those that you'll recognize ABP, um, Dumbia, uh, you'll recognize even for having businesses in England. We felt it was important um, not only to bring those companies in, but actually to use some of their networks as well. And, um, you know, if they identified farms that maybe could do with help or a, a discussion about succession and try and get um, uh, some of this, uh, some of that message out there. So how we're getting that out there as well, we have a matching page goes into the farming press once a, a month um, and it's going in this Saturday into the farming life. Um, we also use the networks of between um, DERA's advise, farm advisory staff and their business development groups. Um, all of these constituent companies and their field officers, and same with the, the milk sector, and um, to get the message out or indeed identify um, families that would, uh, with no commitment, maybe just want a, a chat about what this might look like. We are hoping that we can continue on with funding with uh, DERA probably falling back to maybe um, a third um, with that gap filled with other funders and the industry staying on board because it's important that 
I think industry as well invest in the future. They know that if, if we don't bring in a new generation and new skills, um, with all of the, the debates about um, post-Brexit um, support policy, with climate change, with all of the things that uh, challenges that face agriculture and the importance of agriculture to the Northern Ireland economy. And um, they know that we, we need to keep, um, keep that generational renewal going. Um, I think if there's any questions, I'm happy, Henry, to, to have the, a discussion uh, at that uh, point or take any points, comments, whatever um, you, I can be of help with you. Thanks very much, John. While, oh, there's lots of hands coming up. Uh, so let's um, have a look who we've got. Um, and um, okay, starting with James, I think it is. Um, hi, uh, actually, this, Henry, this is a question for you, if that's allowed. Well, as long as it's not about our, uh, you know, sort of background information, but not about what we're planning to do. Or... Well, this is, this is background information. So, um, so hello, my name's James. I'm a young farmer in West Sussex. I'm a first generation farmer. We've got a tenancy. Um, many of the problems that John has described can be solved with increasing land supply. When you're looking at your policy um, stuff, do you have a target in mind about how much land you're looking to release in the next couple of years? Or is it a little bit you, you don't know and you just hope that some will come in? Do you have some numbers in mind, um, sort of releasing more land and then letting the market solve the problems that John's talked about rather than sort of additional legislation or tax changes that might sit alongside that? Um, by releasing land, you mean people retiring uh, and exiting? Yeah, retiring and exiting, or I don't know, loads of pie in the sky stuff you could do. You could incentivize councils to buy more land. There's a lot, you know, you could have a national land bank and councils could buy farms. There's lots of stuff you could do. I'm not saying that retirement is the only way to do it. I just wondered if you sort of got a number that you guys are. Uh, yeah. No, we couldn't really, that, that sort of detail we can't really talk about. But um, there is a scheme that was also announced in the agricultural transition plan around. A sort of exit deal and that um is going to that there is going to be a consultation post um the uh perda period on that whole issue of people uh leaving land and doing something different so don't think we can do it if we could keep to questions really for john um, more, more detail to come then henry and later in the year then yes uh thank you um good sarah you're next on the list Hi there. Yeah, thanks, Henry. Thanks, John. Um, I just wondered um, about the the sort of support you provide to the new entrants and how how you find those. Do they do they put themselves forward, um, and what support do they then get um, as they take up their farming opportunities? Right. The I suppose the process, Sarah, would be anybody that was interested, we would get them registered and onto uh, the database and that. Registration is uh, reasonably simple, but just gives me an idea of what they're looking for. Um, and if, if, you know, so there'd be a range, so there'd be some that I would be taking out to a farm maybe didn't produce, and then I would, you know, try and structure the deal um, around what suited them if they were, if the, then that young person and the older farmer were wanting to do an arrangement together. Um, I would also say to them, look, they can take, uh, I'm not a, a lawyer and accountant, so take legal advice on that. Um, I, and if they were going ahead, then I would support it by reviewing that. Every, but every three months, and they, certainly they, I would review it twice in the first, in the first, and uh, in, in, inside the first year, you know, to see how it going, were there any problems? Uh, and uh, to iron out and things like that. Other time, other arrangements that I've done that maybe they've they've met each other, but help in structuring it. But it's that's obviously quicker to put together. But if it's going in like completely cold at the start, yes, that's how we would structure it and support it, and broadly for as long as it as it takes. Now, one of the advantages of, of Northern Ireland is. It's not a huge land area, you know, it's, if you think of it, it's like sort of a hundred miles by a hundred miles roughly. So it's not, nowhere completely inaccessible to drive 
two or indeed that you'd have to um, sort of stay over for two days, you know. Um, so John, that is advantage. Yeah. Can I just ask a follow up question on that, John? Is I mean, how do you, I mean, how many people are registering with you? And how do you, I mean, if you've got 10 or 20, how do you choose who to match? You know, couldn't there be a situation where two or three want the same thing? And how do you distinguish between who gets to have a conversation uh, and have a potential partnership? I suppose, Henry, it is probably all, most always sort of naturally fallen a bit easier than that. That we, we would have um, probably maybe three to 400 on the, on the database at the moment. That's older farmers and younger farmers. Certainly the matching page going into the, the farming press every month. I always know that it definitely went in because my phone comes alive on the, on the following Monday and Tuesday just uh, with interest. But it, I suppose the way I would work is I would read and look and see who was a, a closer fit. But it probably naturally progresses is that um, you might want a dairy farm but you don't want to move to County Tyrone. So if I want a dairy farm, I'm happy to move to Tyrone or something. So, it, it, but I have it. I have it. A couple of farms where I've taken out, you know, three, three good candidates to look at, it. and then really the farmer has narrowed it down to the the person that um, uh, they want to work with. So it, it works like that, um, but it has. There's never been, I haven't had many examples where it wasn't, didn't sort of naturally gravitate towards the one person, you know. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Mark, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, please. Thank, thank you, Henry. Uh, John, thanks for a really good uh, presentation. And it's great to see Wesley and the Ulster Farmers Union uh, actively involved. How do, you, how do you make sure that you really do get new entrants because what i what i wonder sometimes is mm. um on schemes like this really it's just farming farming families just sort of churning churning the stock how do you get true new entrants like james attracted to schemes it's it's probably just getting that message opened out i mean the a couple of the you will always have that battle i suppose between someone trying to expand their business, you will have have somebody that's maybe the the second or third in the family that mm. wants to farm as well, but the eldest has uh, has got the, the first the first call on it, if mm. you like. Um, but I suppose we just take it as bringing in new, uh, as long as we're bringing in uh, new people. But we have a we have a significant number of. of mm. Yeah, and it's mainly targeted through probably agricultural college because there's still a significant um, throughput through CAFRE that are wanting to go and do frontline agriculture. So, for example, that, that a young lad that, that moved from North Antrim to a farm in Strangford in County Down, um, you know, was... It was the closest he was was to a farm was his uncle mm. at a farm, but he'd no direct and no way of getting into farming. And um, so he was a classic new entrant coming in and getting the barrier dramatically lowered for him to get into it because he's now, you know, building up to over 200 milking cows on a very good farm in, in South Down. So he was a a classic new entrant. You do, we still, if I went through the database, we still have yep. a considerable number of, of new entrants, but it's mainly our link between the union and um, college that would okay. be getting quite a, a, a supply of, of new, new entrants and not just people expanding. Yeah, thanks, John. And just very quickly, I know Sarah's on the one too, that just one point that you made about access to finance from banks, I'm, I'm a banker, um, is that all, all new startups face those sort of barriers to entry. Um, you know, it's not just, it's not unique to agriculture, but what is unique or has been unique to agriculture is our inability to draw down on things like enterprise finance loan guarantees, which is a 
guarantee scheme from government to you know great businesses that just lack security and uh, and i think now uh, one of the things with the domestic agricultural policy we could consider um, utilizing that scheme or similar schemes to uh, to really support and then which is great business is just lacking that little bit of security so something for us all to think about but uh, no john thanks ever so much really useful john i might just to clarify just a follow-up from uh, my perspective do you give because presumably people who are new to farming may not have the same skills, knowledge, et cetera, so they might be disadvantaged. Do you give any extra support to people um, to get involved, or is it just you take people as they are? Well, I would take people as they are, but I would certainly recommend them, uh, you know, some that I thought were very new, even, even if they were changing, changing say, sector, you know, say they were getting into wanting into dairying or something, I would certainly be wanting to recommend that they would get involved with the, our business development group structures, you know, through uh, Deer and Caffrey, through the Agricultural College and the advisory staff. Because some of those groups are, are really good now, at, you know, benchmarking off other farmers and dealing with other farmers that you get a real sense of shared learning. And uh, and so that's, I would encourage and signpost them to do things like that. Even I suppose if you're ever wanting to tap into things like a new entrant top up on, on basic farm payment, you have to have at least a level two agricultural qualification. And that's probably going to rise to a level three in whatever new support package comes along. Um, so yes, I would signpost and steer people towards that, particularly if someone was very, very new entrant to agriculture or very limited experience of agriculture, yes. Brilliant. Rob? Unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm an accountant, John, in Cumbria. I deal with a lot of dairy farmers. I've got quite a few joint ventures, um, two very, very successful ones with non -farm, people from non-farming backgrounds who now have share, probably 50% shares in businesses with well over a 1,000 cows in each case. Um, they've grown really well, made lots of money, but they're in businesses that generate cash one of the things that struck me was when you put your list up of what businesses you'd been successfully worked with, you had 25 dairy farms, which with an average of like 150 cows and 18 mm -hmm. sort of beef and sheep farms, mm -hmm. which looked like they had an average of sort of 15 cows and 100 sheep. Mm -hmm. Might be, there are lots and lots of farms with those sorts of numbers, but we, we see very few joint venture businesses in the red meat sector simply because farms don't have you know to share profits and to share income you need enough to share and actually critically a lot of these businesses are too small do you find it harder or you know is it far easier to get people in pigs poultry dairy where margins are better outputs higher than it is in sectors that are under far more financial pressure which is the bulk of the beef and sheep sector in reality uh, yes yes um we've it all here today accountants and bankers there's uh, quite a collection of people out there and um, we've no doubt on that rob because the um you know you need you need a, a an income the, uh, the the pie needs to be of a certain size to divide it um no that said, on some of the beef and sheep ones, um, I would also have done stuff with um, part-time, both a part-time older farmer and a younger farmer. Now, you have to be relatively close at hand, so you know, you're not going to travel 30, 40 miles for some uh, part-time income, but it can work um, on that basis as well, that you're not wanting to do huge numbers, but certainly if you're doing a type of joint venture profit share, um, it, it, you know, Darian is reasonably profitable here 
at the minute. Poultry, again, is a, a, there's probably a much more professional model to the way poultry is, um, and indeed even pigs here. There's a lot of people have diversified into pig fattening uh, and stuff like that has been really good for their really good for their business. Um, and I'm not sure we just quite have that professionalism at times in, in the beef sector in the scale that it, it tends to need to be to really do um, a, a lot of joint stuff. But we do do it with, with part-time farm, part-time farmers as well. The figures on the beef are probably slightly harder to trace because some of them, of course, would, you know, there's a lot of considerable number of dairy farms here finish um, cattle like that farm, for example, in Strangford, finished, killed something like £120,000 worth of cattle each year. You know, see the considerable beef business on top of, on top of his dairy uh, one as well. But, um, but I, I do, I take your point on, on the beef sector and the red meat sector, it is, it is difficult. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Cindy. Hello, lovely to meet you all and thank you, John, very much uh, for your work. And thank you, Henry, for taking the space, holding the space. Um, I suppose I'm, I come, my background, we, we have a farm here in Devon and there are a few farmers in the valley who are interested in clustering together in order to transition. Um, I'm also part of a group called Farming the Future, which is looking at regenerative agroecological models, specifically how we can finance transition. So looking at financial models that will support new entrants and so on, um, and I suppose land transitioning. Um, what, what, even though in your, one of your opening slides and you talked about regenerative soil practice, uh, which is critical. We all know we're losing our soil and we have to grow soil or use practices that rebuild soil. Not only that, we've got a bi biodiversity crisis that we're needing to address. Um, and, and I would say that the, uh, apart from leaving Brexit, leaving Europe and, and then rewriting the rule book in the way we manage our land, then you mentioned some of the challenges we faced. And what I'm not hearing is the upskilling that will go alongside this transition of land, because it's actually a retraining exercise and a, an understanding exercise. And I think what I observe outside of my little bubble, which is packed full of scientists and people who know the immediacy of the threat that we're facing, is that I'm not hearing any sense of emergency in your voices, but I can assure you the fact that I'm not hearing it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, and so I've dropped a few things in the chat and it's quite scary to take it on board. And so I'm not expecting to. So, so my question to you is, how are you actually building this in structurally? It's, they're two very different jobs, bringing in youth and uh, actually, uh, uh, looking at our, our best models to not only provide food security in this country because we don't grow enough food, but also uh, robust techniques that mean that when the weather changes, which we know it is, and it's going to change a lot more, and we're going to lose farmland to flooding, you know, th th these are all issues I don't see built into your agenda at all, but it doesn't mean it's not happening because it is. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. John. Th thanks, Cindy. Uh, probably enough there to run a, a, a few conferences on, Cindy. Um, they, uh, I mean, the, the bit on, on upskilling that we're trying to do, I mean, most of the, the vast majority of young farmers that uh, I come into contact with and register and have a real interest in getting into agriculture are uh, incredibly highly educated. I've been actually uh, impressed and surprised by the level um, of, of what people's coming into. Also, the, I suppose the guarantee, and that, as I said, touched on just to Henry's question about if you look at any future support payments um, that's, that's coming into uh, 
we are probably going to set that level up another notch from level two to level three. And that'll include, you know, and I do think actually there's, there's a much better thing about generation change and actually understanding some of the immediate, the immediately faced, you know, with what you've talked about in, in soil, the importance of soil structure, biodiversity. Um, and I think we're all wanting to really grasp the issue of food security. If, if we've learned anything probably from, from the early days of COVID, when there's a few empty shells that, you know, we, we really need to look at, uh, at food security. So it is, it is probably from, from my point, it is looking at the quality of, of people that you're bringing in and wanting to attract and you're wanting them to have been through agricultural college or linking in to Queen's University or other universities. And a sizable number of, I, I would struggle actually to think of anybody that I linked into a farm yet that wasn't, hadn't been through uh, agricultural college or indeed a mix of agricultural college and finished a degree at, at Queen's. So there is, that has been built in, I think with future support, building it in that the levels of education there, because I think, I think in, in generally around succession, we probably years ago suffered nearly from a thing that agriculture, um, well, well, you're either the eldest, you'll have to come home and farm, or you're, uh, you're else uh, the least clever at school, you'll have to come home to farm. Whereas actually farming now is in a, a sizable business where people uh, need, all these, need all these skills. And I think it's a useful debate to have. Also links into some of the work that our business development groups would be doing around linking that into to soils and structure and how that how that's done and, and looked at and indeed looking at agroforestry, how we respond. We have uh, the possibility of our own Northern Ireland Assembly is, is beginning to look at a climate change act um, and agriculture is going to have to, to rise to that and, and do it and how we look at moving. I don't think um, probably zero carbon, net zero carbon would be a runner in, in the same time scale as England here, given that we produce something like enough food for 10 million people, not the 1.8 million that live in Northern Ireland. So we're a mass, you know, we, we export to other parts of the UK a significant amount of food. But it is a debate that agriculture has to have. I would certainly say we've been slow, but I do think there's a real thing about a new generation coming in that understand many of those issues that you've touched on. Thanks, John. Cindy just wanted, to, if you could just say you wanted a brief response and then we'll try and Kate, take Kate. We haven't got much time. Um, thank you. So what I'm hearing oh. is that you're looking to education, subsidies, and uh, and and um, uh, policy in order to drive the change. And I guess what I'm suggesting is that we probably need a faster reaction in terms of the community really understanding, like some sort of position statement that's quite clear. And the other thing I'd say is that there is a real danger, as we have seen with uh, almost every other sector of life, that this is instead going to be driven by huge markets, by agribusiness because nature is going to be commodified. This is gonna happen really fast. And so I can really easily see masses of land being bought up and farmers being pushed off the land if they can answer these targets faster. So I just think I'm really just saying, wake up, this is really happening and the world has changed. And I want to see all of you be able to transition well and ownership to stay with the farmers. I'll leave it there, and, thank and, you. And, no, and that's Sorry. something that, that's something that, I mean, we have a serious commitment to the family farm structure, and I wouldn't want to see agriculture in Northern Ireland or across the UK going down uh, the model that you've uh, that you've suggested. You know, the family farm structure has has been a good model uh, mm -hmm. to, to deliver so mm -hmm. on on some of the things that you're passionate about. Well, Thanks, fine. John. Kate, sorry, can I just bring in Kate now very quickly and then we'll, um, we'll close up. Thanks, Henry. Um, 
Yeah, John, I'm just interested in how your system fits in with um, the government advice advisory um, service that you have. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously you've got quite a strong local um, connections and district advisors and that kind of thing that can maybe help new entrants um, fit into that kind of general support. In England, we don't have that um, district advisor kind mm -hmm. of uh, expertise and, and business advice services. So I, I just wanted to, to know how important you think that is, that is, how your scheme fits into the sort of overall support for farm businesses. I, um, thanks, Kate. I think it, it is hugely important because, I mean, you'll have heard me, I know it's awful when you use some of these acronyms like um, DERA is our Department of Agriculture. So CAFRA is the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise. Um, it's where I, I was a student uh, quite a number of years ago now, unfortunately. But um, so we have a network of advisors through, through CAFRA and, and DERA uh, right throughout that link into businesses. They also coordinate the business development groups that farmers can register and be part of. So we have a very strong advisory service, as you've said, Kate, compared to other parts of the country. But that has been really good and helpful, even in my work in delivering uh, that and helping to identify some farmers that might benefit from maybe a, a chat or a discussion. And then I can pick up and do things and maybe have a discussion that the, the advisors can't maybe touch and areas they can touch on. Um, and I think that's been a really useful contact. So I would have a lot of contact with our CAFRA advisory staff and with the department um, over that, but it's been, been critical probably to link in and to use, and, and to recognize even from the, the questions and discussions here that, that no one person, I or the, the, the farmers union or young farmers or any of the co-ops have all the answers or all the knowledge in this. It is linking in and using all that and using all our own networks to, to help identify people and make connections and uh, meet people. And so but the important is about who's managing the land, maybe not necessarily who owns it, but linking in and making sure there's a, there's a, a farming structure there um, and, and with, the size, with the profitability that we can deliver on. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we, we did start a bit late, so I've let it sort of go over and, I, uh, and people seem to have been able to stay, which is fantastic. Um, we have recorded this, so we'll be posting it so people can look at it again. But uh, I'll just end by thanking John very much for giving us your time and telling us about what's happening in Northern Ireland, which absolutely was really fascinating. And, um, and maybe we'll come back to you to find out more anyway as, as, as we move forward. Uh, and thank you very much, for everyone, giving time to uh, be involved. And uh, we can do an electronic clap, uh, you see, um, in this brave new world. Um, I can't quite find my button to do it. Uh, <laughs> but um, thanks very much, everyone. And we will be in touch with uh, the future programme. And if, you can also follow us on Eventbrite, a new programme. You'll, you'll hear about new events as well. But we will put you in our database and, uh, and, and keep you involved in, in future discussions. Thank you very much all and um, have a good rest of the day. Cheers, Anne. Thank you. Take care now. Bye. Yes, thank you.